Hello everyone, and welcome back to Let's Play Breath of Fire 2. Last episode, we got introduced to Jean's kingdom, but we found an imposter waiting for us. He insists that he is the real deal, despite being a completely different skin color, and imprisoned Jean. We also went to the Wildcat Cafe a bit early to get a 16-point boost we wouldn't have otherwise gotten for our active party. Then we beat up the Jailer, we went through some shenanigans when it turns out he gave his royal ring to Nympho, we got it back, and we're gonna see how things progress from here. And joining me to see that is Skyzo. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. Hello, YouTube. But yeah, this next part is another long dialogue section, and... Because there are so many of those, Sima Fort is one of the most infamous parts in this game, as far as story goes. Probably the main problems is that Jean does not give a hoot about any of this. I mean, we learned last episode from the various villagers. He abandons his kingdom regularly. His sister herself said that. And he's completely uninvested in his own kingdom, in fact, if he'd his way, he would have just sprung from jail and then let the imposter have everything. In fact, even when we get it back for him, he still ditches it again to permanently join our party. He doesn't learn anything, he doesn't change in any way, and in fact the civilians don't seem to care who's ruling it. Outside of a few grumblings that the imposter is a bit strict, but... As far as we can tell, the trains are running fine. I mean, he does do evil things, but they're all in direct response to things that we do. So even then, it's kind of hard to really get that mad at him. What do you think of this whole situation, Skyzo? Well, I don't understand the motivation to do any of this, you know, given what you just said. Indeed. Also, he has a copy of the ring as well, so it looks like the imposter has thought this through. And, yeah, this really isn't our problem. The thing is, there's a thief girl in the jail. That's that blue girl that we just passed up. So, it'd be fine if we were just doing all this so that we could have our backs scratched, but the thing is, the main story never brings this up. You see her on your way, but we saw her once in, like, part three when she bumped into Ryu. And then Bosch saw her in that same episode, and after that, you've never seen her again up until now. So if, if you're not playing this game in one sitting, you kind of just forget what she looks like or what you're even supposed to be doing. There's one singular spot where the game reminds you of what you're supposed to do. Do you know what that is, Skyzo? I'll give you a hint. It's completely optional. Nope, what's the... Party chat. Which is all the way back in Township. Which you have to spend 20 minutes backtracking to. If, for whatever reason, you're curious enough about what your party has to say about all this. Then, Bosch is like, What? There's a thief girl there? That must be the one that framed us! You better make sure you get her, Ryu! And then I think one of the other party members also makes an offhand reference to that. So, only in optional party chat does the game even remind you of why any of this is important. The main story itself doesn't. I mean, I know party chat was sort of a new thing back then, but flavor is supposed to be flavor, not required. It's very bizarre that it, they would lock something like that behind something, so... Right? It would take, like, up to 20 minutes to, to see. I don't understand that. Yeah, and the game sort of gets worse and worse about reminding you of what your mission is. Like, it's pretty blunt about it in Corsair, even with the nonsense we get involved in, but after that, most of the adventure is just us taking any lead we can find, and most of our heroics are just us fixing random problems, which is fine. That's what heroes do, I mean. 
Mina and Nina were beautiful women who would have been enslaved by the evil Joker gang. And they were pretty explicit in their intentions, so obviously we're not going to leave that lying down. Capitan villagers were in imminent peril. Their men and women and children were being swallowed up by that Terrapin beastie. So obviously we'll do something about that as well. Then Sonomo and Granny comes, and that whole plot point is its own can of worms in regards to what it says about Ryu's character, but... At the end of the day, they at least do something minorly helpful, what with fusion and reawakening Ryu's dragon powers. It's just a matter of whether or not we should have taken so much time to build them their own luxury home and everything. Then solving Tapeda's curse? Fairly unimportant, but we're doing a good turn. This Sema Fort thing? Nobody cares. Like, the only one who cares is the imposter who, by all rights, isn't really doing anything that bad, and in fact seems a lot more capable to run a kingdom. And this girl, Pitape, who's characterized as a comic foil to Tapeda, the whole joke being she's this overbearing nag that even the party members criticize in their party chat. Other than that, it just doesn't seem to matter. Which, okay, that would be fine if it was just a short, one-and-done section, but Sema Fort takes longer to get through than just about every other town in the game. We spend like three episodes here, so I kind of want it to matter. I can see that. This whole section to me almost seems like it belongs in a different game. Yeah. I feel like what should have happened is, one, Patape should have struck up a deal with the party. Like, have your party after they initially turn her down and say that they're looking for a thief girl to help out a friend. A thief girl with blue hair and wings, and then she's like, you know what? We got one of those in our jail right now. How about I give her to you if you scratch our backs? Very simple fix to solve that problem, or here's another idea. How about he labels us outlaws for being accomplices to the fake, and he's our enemy that way? By the way, we want to get an iron plate for Lean since we didn't do that earlier. We also want at least four wisdom seeds going into this next dungeon. Preferably seven, but four is the minimum. That should allow you to bust up all the bosses real good. Also want to get some conches for later. Again, not essential, but we'll need them at some point, and they're here. And smoke bombs purely for speed. Again, if you're new to the game, you can skimp out on them just so you get more experience in gold. But I choose to buy them because we're good at the game. And finally... Spend whatever leftovers you have on vitamins. They heal 100 HP, and by now, herbs are getting a little obsoleted. So, there you go. I mean, it's also possible you could just buy a whole bunch of herbs, but that takes inventory. It's fair enough. Also, keep that other pink frog called Fiolina in mind for... Well, I'd say later, but we're gonna see the reason right now! Yeah. So that guy that was mouthing off at his captain in the last episode, apparently the folks didn't take kindly to that and stuck him up there to die, but fortunately, Fiolina and Fiona de Quester are here to mount a daring rescue operation. Nice. And I wonder what happens if you say, if you pick the other option to let him rot. She's just like, oh no, wherever could he be? And you just don't get anywhere. It's sort of a non-verbal, but thou must. Really? So you can just go back at any time, right? And save him anyway? I guess. I mean, Violina's the one that does the saving. And we do need to do that, because behind that windmill are the bucket systems that we need to get into the basement. Yeah, we kind of skipped over it, but... The imposter and Jean are now currently engaged in a cooking contest. 
because Jean is known as a uh, fantastic chef. A bit asinine, but on the other hand, I get to play again, so... And by the way, it doesn't matter what you choose there. Either one will get you the uh, jail rooftop keys. The only difference is if you ask for info, he tells you about the zenny hidden in the wall. Speaking of which, there's a room that we missed that I forgot about that also contains a fourth set of a thousand zenny. Make sure you get that. If you don't, I'll show it off in the next episode. Also speaking on that subject, if you found yourself short of money, you could consider backtracking back to the shop now that we got that extra set of cash. It's just not efficient, and I planned ahead, so that's why I'm not doing that. But you can do as you will. All right. Oh, here's a very, uh, special character. The Green Bottle Fly. You know what his shtick is, Skyzo? Looks like he's very edgy. Yeah, he spends the entirety of his existence calling you retards. And before you ask, yeah, that's kind of what he said in the old script. Well, the original Japanese script, I mean. Also, first of all, just to defend, this is a timed battle. It ends after five rounds, but... Basically, in the original script, he said something like Nkosama and Te Meira. Basically, just means shitheads or shit for brains, dickheads, womb brooms, various things like that. The literal definition of it is crap or poop or something like that. So, he is crass, he is unpleasant, and all that. It's just not speaking slurs, ableist slurs, like he is here, and that's one of the things Ryu Sui said he'd change if he ever went back over the script again. Right. Well, to the translator's credit, retard does roll off the tongue easier than those other words, so there's that. That's true. That's true. It is still a deviation. Man, that poor guy just died. Harsh. Wait, so that thing killed it? Yep. I have no idea how. I mean, how, look how small he is. You'd think a frog would just swallow him. Well, not this guy. He was born in Russia, so you know, gold fly eat frog. Anyway, it's just rearranging my items to have smoke bombs at the top. Since you're using them repeatedly, it's faster menuing to just have them there. Anyways, first encounter. These guys are interesting, if a bit scary. Most dangerous are the Mimics, who have a new status ailment, the zombie attack. Anyone afflicted with that will have a free turn, but then they become zombies afterwards. And once they're zombies, they will attack you instead of the enemy and once the battle ends they just end up dead you have to revive them it's a nasty status ailment and you can tell when it gets landed by say when lean turns purple like she is there so i need to kill these guys before the turn ends or else she's dead that's part of why i bought the copper baton and the iron knuckle of course, if you followed the bonus episode and got all those overpowered weapons, or if you just got T-Dragon, that's not so much a problem. Or if you got Slice for Sten, but we didn't do those things, so we gotta choose our attacks carefully. And for that, I usually use Cat plus Sten or Ryu plus Ram. Right. Well, it's a good thing that there's a charge-up turn for that. Imagine that Sten is like turns to a zombie, right? And he has very high attacks, so... Yeah. Also, here's another new enemy. These guys aren't a big deal. They just... They're annoyingly bulky. Sten can do decent damage with the Silver Knife since it's wholly elemental, but everyone else, not so much, because spirit enemies resist everything but wholly, which they're weak to, so... Kind of like Steel in Pokémon. Thankfully, they're not immune to things like that, like how steel is immune to poison and such. 
That is true. There are a few enemies that have magic immunity, although due to bad programming, there's a good way of punching through those guys as well. And hey, check this out, Skyzo, a coin. We don't need them to drop anything as we've routed things to where we only need the two coins you get no matter what, but in some fishing spots, there are these guys called Maneros, who if you fish them up with a coin as bait, they will sell various weapons, items, armor, things like that. And the things we're gonna buy from them are extremely useful, so... If you miss out on the mandatory coins, that could be good, but we don't need them to drop it. Anyways, let's talk about this boss here, the Giant Worm. He's the first to go by a semi-fixed pattern, just like Dragon Quest VI, if you watched that Let's Play. In this guy's case, he will always use Dream Breath on turn one, which is why I had my guys attack each other, that's the only way to break that. Turn 2 will always be a critical hit, turn 3 will be a non-critical hit, and then turn 4 will either be Poison Breath, a crit, or a non-crit. It also has a 50% chance to counter all melees, so basically you want most of our damage to come from the Whelp spells, which do not activate counter. That won't quite be enough to kill him, but... If we just stack on like 87 or something additional damage from Sea Moon or something, that should be enough. So just remember, no melee attacks and defend on turn two and have people attack each other on turn one and you should be good. And if you got some dream jewels in the previous bonus episode, then you're really set for success. Right, so from what I understand is that once his cycle of moves ends, right, it just loops over to the beginning. Is that it? Yep. That's fair enough. Yeah. I wish they did that more often, like with, say, Nympho. The game designers have a bad habit of making the bosses too unstructured, which is how you got nonsense like her occasionally stun-locking you with Dream Breath and Jolt. If they just used a fixed pattern for that, the fight would have been fine. Well, I imagine the problem with that is that you would have easier bosses, right? Because you can always know what they'll do, so... Only if you've fought them a few times. Well, that's fair enough, but... It's the approach I prefer. I feel like you either have to do that, or you just have to make the bosses not capable of doing anything threatening, so that it doesn't matter how random they are. That's my opinion, though. Anyways, the last thing I will say before this battle ends is that if you're playing on the Game Boy Advance version, you might consider switching Sten to some lighter armor, because he's only barely slower than the worm thing here. And Game Boy Advance gives you twice the experience, so he has the possibility of outspeeding if you're either much higher level than I am or playing the Game Boy Advance. So keep that in mind, keep that in mind. It's not like super important or anything, but it's a minor optimization for lean sleeping or something. Also, I like the old translation where he literally calls it the worm boss. I was gonna ask, like, what's the importance of warm meat? Because we're in a cooking contest. Oh, so you're gonna use that, it's like a key item. Yeah, just like the green bottle and something else. By the way, at this point we're running from all preemptive attacks, because at this point we're close to when the game gets a lot easier and we're sufficiently high enough leveled anyway, so that's what I'm gonna do from now on. You don't have to make that choice, though. So, smoke bombs you can save money on, initiatives you can get free EXP and gold on, or buying less wisdom seeds and more vitamins, that could also work. So, you got options. Right, so it looks like when you start a battle with the smoke bomb equipped, right? I think that's how that works. And you just, like, you just skip the battle. 
when you use it, you just, for 64 steps, get halved encounter rates. Oh, so it's not even 100%. But it, you can still tell the difference over a long period of time. Like, even with it on, you can get into a lot of fights, right? That's true. The encounter rate in this game is fairly high in some areas. Yeah. Oh! I forgot something important. You can cure the zombie stat with Rand's Purify. That's really only helpful if only one guy got purified, because otherwise if two guys are turn it into zombies, you, you're not going to be able to save all of them, but it's something to keep in mind. Sorry I forgot to mention that. That's fine. Oh, and the Guts Belt, it's supposed to increase your gut stat, which basically controls how likely you are to revive after getting dropped to 0 HP, but it's bugged. So just sell it. So it just does nothing? Correct. Well, at least it's not detrimental, right? Because you remember this crazy glitch on the first Pokemon games. Like, you had you this move like called Focus Energy, and instead of increasing your crit rate, it lowered it. Yeah. Although something similar does happen. You know, regarding the Speed Shoes initiative thing and the bonus. And by the way, these guys are completely vanilla. They don't have increased crit rate. They just got unlucky there. Just auto-battle them, you'll be fine. But, yeah, anyways, remember in the bonus episode we last did, where Ryu could equip two accessory slots and lower your chance of a preemptive as a result? Right, that was a bug. Yep, that was a bug. Helpful one, though. So make sure you always have at least one empty accessory slot, and you'll always have a 25% chance of getting initiatives, no matter what. Otherwise, it would have fluctuated with the hidden clocks. I gotta say, even though these enemies are very weak, they're pretty gross. They are. They are. Misty would have a field day with this one. Oh, yeah. Ah, you had to think about that one for a minute, huh? Because that was going way back in the show's history. Also, in case you're curious, that bug with the initiative is because the game is supposed to check for a fast shoe or speed shoe item. But instead of checking byte 40, it checks address 40, which has a byte of zero by default. So basically... It checks to see if there's zero somewhere in the accessory slots of the lead character. That's why that happens. I think we fought this monster before. The same sprite right in the beginning. We did. This guy just happens to be tougher, that's all. Although he doesn't have a random chance of reviving, so that's good. Well, it's surprising that this game doesn't reuse as many assets as you think. Indeed. Like, for whatever problems it has, the graphical assets are not one of them. It is beautiful. It is a beautiful looking game. Anyways, this guy is incredibly easy. We prefer to have seven wisdom seeds so we can just spam flame whelps and do 512 every turn, but... If you didn't have the money for that, you can basically just auto-battle and heal as needed, and it'll be fine. In fact, it's technically a better use of money if you just bought four vitamins instead of one wisdom seed. You'll have more healing that way and be safer. It's just, I like my efficiency. I can see that. Yeah, I considered it sort of my, uh, niche, if you will. The thing that separates me from all the other YouTubers. Because, you know, old school JRPGs from the Super Nintendo days. You know, the competition is just so fierce. The market's oversaturated. Like, everyone knows that's what draws in the crowds. Anyways, make sure you have full AP and HP for this next boss, and before we get into him, I want to point something out. You notice the way he talks and has personality, right? Right, and what about that? 
we are hunting these guys down to cook to help Jean get his kingdom back. Which already is kind of dubious, which is probably why they had to make this guy so unpleasant, but... Add to the fact that nothing even comes of it, and it's just kind of a shame, and I don't think the game's writers realize that. Well, I don't watch much anime these days, but this whole section just reminds me of those filler episodes that you just want to not watch, pretty much. Yeah. Anyways, I should talk about the fight itself. This guy is pretty deadly. He has a 75% chance to attack twice and a 100% chance of countering all melee attacks for as long as his HP is 146 or higher. After it gets below that point, he interrupts the round, even if there were more guys that were supposed to attack, and then he gets a 100% crit rate, just loses the counters. Yes, 100% crit rate, I said that right. Which is why we wanted to crush the guy in round 1. We wanted to use a flame well, we wanted to use a kamikaze ball, or void sphere as it's called in this translation, we got that from the dragon cave. And we wanted to use a sea moon coupled with a melee from lean. Do all that, and you should crush it in one turn without activating the interrupt thing that I mentioned before. Or you could just do something like Thunder Dragon, and then use the Void Sphere, or Sea Moon, or whatever floats your boat. But yeah, I think that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for joining me. This is Fiona Day Quester signing out. Have a nice day, everyone, and God bless you. Alright, we'll see you later, YouTube. Bye! Oh, and one more thing. I like the Green Bottle's dying quote. He spends the whole time calling us retards, but then when he dies, he just says, Ugh! You suck! He just says we suck. I mean, it's fitting for his character. I know, but like, he calls us retards when he's doing just fine and then says we suck with his dying breath. I mean, it's kind of like in Mega Man X5 when Sigma is dying for the final time and he just says darn. <laughs> oh yeah, I can see that. <laughs> oh, speaking of that, this is funny. In the old translation, the guy actually says damn. You suck when he is dying. He said that on a Super Nintendo console back in the days of censorship. Like, it is amazing what this game got away with. Well, I imagine the rating for the game suffered because of it. It didn't. It was just E-rated. Oh, that's surprising. So basically, we got a super edgy game in exchange for it also being infamously badly translated. <laughs> like, one of the worst translations of all time. It's the best of both worlds, you could say. I suppose. Anyways, now we can stop recording.